Welcome, welcome back, beautiful people. In criminal claims, that's either brought against you or the ones that you're bringing. There's this thing called mens rea. Mens rea is a state of mind while the man or woman was doing something. Whenever you hear them say, well, we have to have you do psychological evaluation. Well, they're trying to gauge your mens rea to see whether you can claim the affirmative defense of not being mentally right. To see or not whether you have some psychological issue. Many people who have done hideous things in the past have actually gotten away by claiming mental illness. That's a small chunk of mens rea and how it's used. Another part of mens rea, which is the state of mind of someone, whether they did it on purpose, something that's bad, or it was just an accident. Therefore, we're going to afford them sovereign immunity. Because it was not willful. They didn't do it negligently. There was no gross negligence. Another part of mens rea are those things, such as negligence, gross negligence, acts performed maliciously, and acts performed with intentional misconduct. When any of these aspects of mens rea, which is the state of mind, is not met, that thing called sovereign immunity kicks in. We're going to go over the elements of the offshoot of mens rea which are different types of negligence, which is the intentional misconduct, and whether someone acted maliciously, or whether someone acted with deliberate indifference. Let's go over it. Mens rea. Mens rea refers to criminal intent. The intent makes the law, and the intent also determines the crime. Just like with any legislative law, you receive the intent of Congress. They will lay it out to you. The intent is the substance. When it comes to crimes, someone must have intended to create the crime in order for you to find them guilty. If you did it on purpose, in layman's term, then you are guilty. But not always, in fact, because you can do something on purpose, but does that mean you're guilty? Which mean, which brings us to the concept of intent. Because you can purposefully do something with the intent of actually not breaking the law. This is the reason why there are different offshoots of mens rea. So the intent of a criminal act is not as simple as you think an intent to be in a daily, regular activity. So let's tiptoe into it and gently deal with it one at a time in this same video. So I urge you to listen very carefully because even when you bring a claim against an entity or when you attempt to sue someone personally, these are the quote elements that you'll be using in between your sentence. You know very much like when you're trying to work with a, a machinery. You need a, a flavor of persistence with the main ingredient of patience. When it comes to pen and paper, you need a flavor of creative thinking that would allow you to implement the elements into the language of what you're describing so that it flows like water, so that it flows like air. Once you have that flavor of creative thinking, you need the main recipe, the main ingredient, not just an additive just to give it a taste but the main substance of the nutritional value of that food, call that piece of paper or claim that you're cooking up, you need competence to be the main substance with a flavor of creative thinking. So let's deal with the competence and the varying degrees of what intent is. Because when you bring a claim, although we'll be speaking mainly about criminal ones, it also applies with civil. Whenever you bring any claim, at the end of the day, what you want to show by pointing to the element, standard, and test of your claim 
you're bringing malicious prosecution, there's an element standing in test of it. The element of malicious prosecution was that somebody used some type of system, one way or the other, it doesn't have to be the court system, but any type of system that's well established to bring a claim against you. And that claim, you were vindicated of it. That's one. Two, you were vindicated of that claim. And the reason why you were vindicated of such a claim was because they didn't have the ability to do that in the first place. That's three. Those are the three elements of malicious prosecution. On YouTube, we went over that. But in summary and in short, that's that. Then there's this thing called a civil right. There are elements to federal civil rights claims. There are elements to state civil rights claims. State civil rights claims usually is restricted to discrimination based on race, gender, sex, or color, ethnicity, religion, etc. That's the state civil right claim. On a federal level, it tells you you have to fetter it to a bill of right. And then you have to fetter it to other activities like battery, assaults, hate crime. You see how hate crime links with the state element of civil rights, which is based on discrimination? And each of those specific terminologies, battery, hate crime, so and so, have their own elements. But then there is this thing called mens rea, which is the pot to which you put in all those claim inside. Remember, you need creative thinking as the flavor, right? Then you need the main ingredients that you're adding flavor to, to be your competence. The competence is what you put in a pot. That pot is called the intent of the other party. Because you can know all the elements, all the standard, all the tests to the claims that you bring in. And sizzle it up real good and spice it up and put good flavors you can be well articulated on paper but what are you cooking with are you just putting everything in the middle of the air and you so what's going on is there a cauldron are you just throwing everything on top of the fire and hoping you're gonna end up with a good meal that pot that hold everything together is how you and when you show that this man or this woman or this organization that they have a system on their end that's being used against me. They had the intent to do just that. Because if the intent can be shown, then all you've just done is effectively list the standard test and element. But how do we know they actually truly intended to do it? It's called mens rea. Although mens rea applies more in criminal cases, the specific Latin term, but nonetheless, mens rea also applies in civil cases because the intent is always there. Always, no matter what. But just more so on a criminal level. Mens rea refers to criminal intent. The literal translation from Latin is, quote, guilty mind. The plural of mens rea is mentis rea. A mens rea refers to a state of mind statutorily required in order to convict a particular defendant of a particular crime. Establishing the mens rea of an offender is usually necessary to prove guilt in a criminal trial. Remember, you're looking at the intent of someone and although the example here points you to criminal related matters, know that it's not just limited to criminal related matters. It's more highlighted to criminal related matters because criminal related matters usually involve human life and some serious damage. So they have to go straight more and restrict the quality of what's being cooked to the pot itself, which is the intent. And truth also is if you cook you know when you use certain types of pot everything turns out differently it tastes differently and they're letting you know that that thing called the outcome or the meal that you're gonna prepare aka your remedy or your recourse the way it's gonna turn out depends on the type of pot that you use the intent the prosecution typically the, the one bringing the claim typically must prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Oh, look at this. Remember in the past, we went over the standard of evidence. 
whereas in criminal case, beyond reasonable doubt is the proper standard of evidence that you need to bring forth. And they're letting you know when it comes to the intent. The way you're going to show their intent in criminal matters must be beyond reasonable doubt. And accordingly in civil matters, it must be based on preponderance of evidence, meaning just give us at least a little bit more than 50% chance or 50% evidence that this thing that you're saying exists. Then we'll go with it. So now you see why the concept of mens rea or a guilty mind is more applicable to criminal matters because if all it takes is just a little bit more than 50% men F, according to the standard of grading in North America, if all it takes just a little bit more than a 50% chance for us to say that you're guilty in a matter that really does not harm life or put pursuit of happiness in jeopardy, then that's a bit arbitrary and unconstitutional. Therefore, the concept of guilty mind is more applicable to criminal matters whereby the standard of evidence based on the burden of proof is usually beyond reasonable doubt. Now you see the reason why mens rea or the concept of a guilty mind is more applicable to criminal matters because the burden of proof or the standard of evidence is usually higher. The prosecution, aka the one bringing a claim, typically must prove beyond reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the offense with culpable state of mind. Just as Holmes' culpable state of mind just basically means culpable is when something is or someone deserves something, then you're, you're guilty. State of mind being men. Culpable, rea. In other words, a guilty mind. Justice Holmes famously illustrated the concept of intent when he said, quote, even a dog knows the difference between being stumbled over and being kicked. In other words, it is beyond reasonable doubt based on what you have proven about the act of the other party to which you bring a claim against, that they did that thing beyond reasonable doubt Hence, this lowly example. See, these people, who a lot of people hate, as much as a lot of people who hate them, don't realize, the only thing that makes a human a human being is a human mind. The body that the human being carries around is an animal one. I'll say that again. The only thing that makes a human being a human being is the human mind, the body is animal. The human body has blood, a dog, a cat, a fish, a bat, a squirrel have blood. The human body have muscles, those other animals have muscles. The human body have subcutaneous and other type of fat. So do any other animals. This mechanic tool called the body is animal in nature. And the only thing that separates man, men, from animals is the mind. These analogies and comparisons are no mere accident. Neither are they made out of hate or arrogance when these people write these things. They put these basics of what we are made of into consideration. The reason why most people are in a constant state of fear is because they are allowing the animal body to rule the human mind. They are allowing something retroactive, something after the fact, something inferior, to control something more substantive. The reason why a feral cat or a dog will see someone and bark or hiss or run away or get defensive. It's because of the animal instinct. Do you know most humans walk around every day looking good, smelling good, acting all confident, but their minds are not human. It is very much like an animal because they allow the fear nature of the physical body and the sensation to govern them. Have your intuition on point. 
but know that the divine creator afforded you a human mind for a very good reason. And that human mind is what separates you from the rest of the hierarchies of existence on earth. That human mind is what allows you to be the lord of the land to govern every animal and every plant on this earth. Put it to use. Or else those on the other end who are governing the affairs of men, the mind of people, they will treat you like an animal if you don't stop for a moment and think like a human being. When people have some wrong done to them and they eagerly, it's like an itch, it's like an itch to quickly do something. A sense of urgency is right and correct because the complete 55 minute video is on a Patreon page. Take care. Best of luck.